Massive ships use ropes to keep themselves alongside a berth, but when the weather picks up and the ship starts surging, we have a problem. The force applied by the ship increases, sometimes even exceeding the braking load of the ropes, leading to one of them snapping. Up on deck, the force from the braking line whips it across the ship, striking a crew member who sadly doesn't survive the injury. Although this is a fictional scenario, the story is all too familiar to those who work on ships, so why do massive ships still use ropes? And given that they do, what can be done to keep the crew safe and is there an alternative? When ships come into port, they need to stay alongside the quay to be able to load or unload cargo, take on stores and fuel and allow the crew to get ashore. It's been the same for thousands of years and in that time the solution hasn't really changed much. You simply tie a ship alongside using mooring ropes. Obviously, ships nowadays are somewhat larger than ships from years gone by, but rope technology has also improved to such an extent that smaller ships can still be secured by only one or two ropes. The minimum is obviously one line forwards and another line aft, at less than 45 degrees to the ship so that each line both keeps the ship alongside and stops it from moving forwards or backwards. Remember, of course, that a ship tight alongside won't move forwards and backwards anyway due to friction between the ship and the key, so the priority when using only two lines is just to keep it alongside. To increase the security of the mooring, you'd come up to what's known as one and one fore and aft. This means one headline or stern line at each end, plus one spring line. The headline and stern line keep the ship tight into the berth and the spring lines act to stop it from moving forwards and backwards. As the ship size increases, it's a simple case of adding more and more lines until you get to the typical arrangement used on the largest ships, six and two, fore and aft. Usually, this will be two headlines leading around 45 degrees on the bow, two breast lines at almost right angles, two lines between those and two spring lines with the same sort of arrangement at the other end. Obviously, the exact arrangement depends on the positioning of the mooring bollards and things, but this is a good general example. 6 and 2 holds most ships pretty securely, but if you're expecting the weather to increase, particularly an offshore breeze or something, you will run more. The most I've ever seen was 9 and 3, I think, but when you're in that territory, you'll also be bringing thrusters online and calling up tugs to help out as well. If you don't, no matter how many lines you have out, chances are that some of them are going to start parting. A few months ago, you probably saw in the news when a cruise ship in Mallorca got caught in strong winds and parted a load of mooring lines. They ended up anchoring outside the port until the weather improved, then returning to collect the passengers. The problem is that once one line breaks, it can start a bit of a chain reaction. If, for example, all lines are out with even tension, maybe one of the breast lines breaks, but then the load that it had been carrying is suddenly distributed among the remaining lines, possibly pushing them over their limits as well. Of course, what's actually more likely is that one line was tensioned more than the rest initially, so once that line breaks, then the load is distributed better, so the ship is actually more secure. Either way, when a line does break, the most dangerous place to be is on the mooring deck. The act of tensioning a line inevitably stretches the line, storing up potential energy, which is released when it snaps. That release of energy causes the line to whip backwards, which, if the line was straight, will make it snap straight back. The thing is, on a mooring deck, lines take all sorts of different paths from winches, around bits, through fair leads, and down to the quayside. When one of these breaks, a section will still whip straight back, but it will then take a different path every time it turns a corner. These areas are known as snapback zones, and it's vital for seafarers to know where they can be. In the past, it was common for snapback zones to be painted onto the deck, but that had the unintended consequence of making people believe that anywhere outside the painted area was safe. In actual fact, on most mooring decks, it's actually better to think of the entire deck as a snapback zone. It does depend on what the mooring line is made of, of course. Nylon, for example, stretches somewhat more than other ropes, storing significantly more potential energy, meaning it can snap right across the deck. Other lines, such as high-tech HMPE, that's high modulus polyethylene, you might know it from the brand name Dyneema, barely stretches at all, meaning that when they break, they may well just fall straight down to the deck and not snap back at all. Of course, it sounds like the simple answer is to just always use HMPE, but in actual fact, the lack of stretch means that it can't easily absorb shock loads, making it less useful, even though you could argue it's safer. Saying that, we all know that technology continues to develop, so the use of ropes for mooring may not last much longer. There are already some exciting developments in docking technology, pretty much all of which revolve around the use of some sort of sticky device, usually vacuum or magnetic, to attach to the ship's side, holding it in place with hydraulics. There are obvious downsides such as the strength of the shell plating and potential conflicts with shell doors, but overall, I do like the look of the direction of travel. 
Yes, modern ships do still use ropes for mooring, despite the downsides, but at some point, I'm sure we'll find something better.